This is Coda Radio, episode 202 for April 25th, 2016. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Coder Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. This episode is brought to you by our two fine sponsors, DigitalOcean and Linux Academy. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this year's show goes on. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is really our heroic host, nearly a father, in fact. Why, folks, yes, it is the Michael Dominic. Hello, Michael. I am your father. <laughs> you are all of our fathers. And you know what? Speaking of fathers, we have one that joins us in studio right now. You'll never guess it. Why, yes, folks, it really truly is out of here. Luke Skywalker. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not Luke Skywalker. Right. It is, in fact, Mr. Noah. Hello, Noah. Hello. Hello. Welcome back. Thank it you both gentlemen for letting me be here. Well, you know, it turns out uh, later on in the show, we'll be discussing some topics that may be relevant to your interests. So we mm -hmm. thought it'd be fun to have you on the show to discuss those very things. Mr. Dominic has had many adventures to share with us, and uh, I think you'll probably find them interesting. We also have uh, sort of uh, an interesting passing that I just we wanted to make note of in the show. It's sort of sad when these things happen, but we think it's noteworthy. Uh, some interesting rumors regarding the future of development on Android that I am really excited to talk about. And then Mike's going to share uh, his new rig that he bought and his switching adventures. He's got an update on all of that. But before we started, you know, you joined me last week on the Coda Radio program, Mr. Right. Noah. And you know, Mike, I don't know, if you have the, I don't know if you have a copy of the video feed up. Uh, I, we could also send it to you on the Skype if you want. But oh, I have it up. We, have, uh, we got back uh, from Linux Fest Northwest, and uh, it was... Crazy here at the JB1 studios. It was packed full of geeks. Uh, and ironically, funny, there's Noah uh, on a MacBook, right? Let's zoom. Wait, I got to zoom no, in no, and hands was, on that Noah. Was, that was not my MacBook. There's Noah that was on not my MacBook. That was not my MacBook. You, you could were tell. You, you were holding it for a friend? No. Is that what you were going to say? No. It was a freedom hating geek that was here. Well, no, he wasn't freedom hating. He was secretly freedom loving, but he didn't know it at the time. And so he yeah. brought it here. And I thought I would take on the six hour task of converting it Did to Did it Linux. take that long? Yeah. So before you go on, what I love about this picture is. Uh, you can really tell it's been a crazy week here in the studio because the 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 prop that Noah has the MacBook on is one of many motherboard boxes that's around the studio. <laughs> so like, I I yeah, it's an Asus, mother yeah, oh, it's a, yeah, it's an AS Rock. Uh, yeah. So, anyways, it has been a crazy week here, and uh, we had a big we had a big party at the studio last night. People were uh, celebrating the end of Linux Fest Northwest. And Mike, I know you've been trying to switch to Linux. We had we had people here last night switching to Linux. How did that go? No, how did that MacBook go? Because you know Mike's been trying it on a on a Dell. Mm -hmm. So uh, the gentleman that was here, he's actually a developer, and he's actually in the chat room, the kid, and um, he was he uses a program called um, he programs in Python, I believe, and there's there's a program, a professional program IDE that he uses. Now we started it up under Mac OS, and it took over five like five six minutes for that one program to for launch. this Python IDE. Yeah, we installed Antergos. And it launched almost immediately. So really? I said, you know, I, I dislike Macs and I dislike Apple and I dislike Mac OS, but I'm willing to be, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to lie about it. I mean, the reality is it probably just needs to have Mac OS reinstalled. So I told him that. I said, you know, you probably clean, get similar effects if you, you just reinstall Mac OS. So it you, turns you, out, you, 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 you admitted that it might have been because it was like a six, seven, right. eight. I thought maybe he bought it with Snow Leopard. It was like, it was an older, like it had an optical drive, right? 2011 ish. Okay. So I'm guessing it shipped with like Snow Leopard and had been upgraded every time. And so I tell him this and he says, no, no, you don't understand. I have reinstalled numerous times. This is a fresh install and it's still doing this. Wow. And so under Ubuntu, it was way faster. And we actually got that on video. Uh, and so last night we actually videoed. We it, it was so much time opening under Mac OS that Emma had time to come into the shot, sit down, have a monologue, get up, get out of shot, and then we went back to continuing before. Well, and the kid can probably tell us what the uh, uh, PyCharm. That's the name of the uh, IDE that he's using, PyCharm Professional. Um, and so it, it was. It was a nice stark contrast because there are a few things that I do, obviously, that exist on both the Mac and 
Linux. And of course, everything that I do is typically not very resource intensive. And so it works well on, you know, almost any piece of hardware. Uh, so it was interesting to be able to talk to a developer and him to, you know, instantly grok the power of and, and capabilities of Linux. Hmm. So uh, Pi of Charm is from JetBrains, which is actually, right. it's, a, it's a company we've talked a lot about. Mike, have you ever experienced this between jumping between OSs and just the tools being slower under one platform? So, yeah, my entire tool chain is basically JetBrains at this point, right? Um, I use, uh, no, I don't know this, but uh, well, I do know this, but I don't know if you do. Android Studio is actually a JetBrains project. Okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, so Android Studio, AppCode, RubyMine, which I use a lot, uh, WebStorm, PHP, they have a WebStorm is their PHP equivalency of PyCharm. It's all JetBrains, and they're all Java programs, basically, right? So they're written in Java. They run fine on Mac, in my experience. They run really fast on Linux. I will give Linux that. They run like shit on Windows, though. <laughs> <laughs> and well, that'll make fact, happy. In fact, I'm, I'm suffering a problem in IntelliJ, which is the, uh, the Java version. It's a sister to Android Studio, we could say where on a Windows machine, it can't render the fonts correctly, and they're blurred out. I thought I was going blind, in fact. You know what I find to be interesting? I mean, just going back to the load time stuff, is it's not like the, the even the most of the base Mac software, or I mean hardware, it's not really slouchy stuff. Usually you have an SSD in there. Mm-hmm. Usually you have a graphics of some kind in there that's at least decent. You know, I mean, it's it's... I don't know. I, I, I find it to be interesting. I almost wonder if it's that damn file system, Noah. That damn HFS file system. Yeah, maybe, but would that explain why it wouldn't load on like on a fresh install? I mean, I can understand when yeah. you get a lot mm. of stuff bogged down on the computer, but yeah. you know, I mean, what's the base Mac OS? And so is the so the kid is uh, now he's going to do his PyCharm uh, work under uh, Linux. Yeah, he was he was kind of blown away. Now he's having a little bit of an issue getting Slack to work, and I was actually just working with him in the Wait, chat room. Uh, Slack under Antegros. Slack, Antigris? the yeah. web app. Slack's a- it's a web app. Well, it's not. There's a desktop app. Oh, you mean like Scud or whatever it is? The, uh... No, no, no. There's an official Slack desktop app. There is? There is. Yeah, it looks What's like What's the point? It looks like this. What's the point? It uh, it, it enables notifications that automatically leave the browser open. Oh, and you can oh. paste pictures and stuff in. And How, Oh, really? Yeah. I should try to look into that. <laughs> that? Yeah. Uh-oh, the Poe's coming to get you, Mike. The Poe's coming to yeah. get you. You know, I, I, I'm about to say something awesome about Mac, and, and they know. So Yeah. There they you go. Me. Uh-oh, something awesome about Mac. You know, before we get too far into it, do you want to just take a sec and uh, and just mention uh, Bill Campbell? And uh, this was this was April 18th this happened. Uh, yeah, Bill Campbell. Yeah, he's sort of a well-known um, – well, actually, I guess he's maybe not really well-known. That's you kind know, of the he, thing. Yeah, he was like – and I don't want to get too much into it. He's been an advisor. Think of him as so, sort of a Dutch uncle to a lot of the, you know, the Apples, the in, Inuits um, – Oh God! What's the other big one, Chris? Save me. What you mean, like as far as the, like industry folks that have uh, industry been folks, advised right. he's been a on lot the board. of CEOs? I mean, he's been on the yeah. boards of a lot of companies. He's done private adv- advisories. He's worked for some of these companies. Uh, everybody from Steve Jobs, Larry Page, uh, Jeff Bezos. Uh, he's been friends with all of them, and uh, they all call him the coach, which is kind of a cool yeah. thing. You know, one interesting thing about him, and we'll we'll get off of it. Um, you know, he passed away. It's very sad is he's one of the few, I would say, higher-powered Silicon Valley executives that nobody ha- has anything bad to say. You can't find... <laughs> There's no dirt. No matter, yeah. no matter how hard you search, you cannot find dirt on this yeah. guy. They called him the but, coach because he was a coach, uh, I think, for uh, college sports, for yeah, college sports ball. And he, uh, he passed away at 75 after a long battle with cancer. So, uh, yeah, and it's, it's kind of... Uh, it is sort of more, in some ways, more appropriate to sort of uh, give tribute to some of the figureheads that uh, aren't as well-known. That uh, that uh, don't, people don't really know about. Okay, so uh, we have a couple of things to get into, like uh, future development topics, uh, maybe uh, Google's solution to the Oracle lawsuit, all of that kind of uh, shenanigans. First, though, before we get too far, if you get interested in any of the topics we're covering today or have in the past and you want to learn more, I have to recommend Linux Academy, linuxacademy.com slash coders. Go there and land on that page to support this show and get yourself the Coder Radio discount. No, one of the things that you probably could attest to is in the past, before you actually got behind the microphone on these shows, mm-hmm. you must have listened and heard us talk about topics and be like, I'd like to know more about that. All the time, yeah. Back in the day, we didn't really have a resource like Linux Academy. This no, is, we had Google. Yeah, we had Google and or, you know, go take, uh, go sign up at your uh, local community college or go sign up at, you know, there was like, there were certain avenues you could ginormous. self-teach, yeah, you could buy a book, you, and if you really wanted like really like stuff that would get you a job, well, then you got to go to like 
like a college or a community college or something like that. All those have huge barriers. I mean, there's a cost involved with the college yeah. and there's some sort of an embarrassment factor of, you know, I'm 30 years old. I don't really want to go sit in a community college right. with a bunch of Well, not 18, to mention just a huge time commitment. And what are you going to do? You're going to go after work? Like right. you're going to drive there after work? And, and then I mean, yeah. I've done it. Yeah, I did it. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I, I, I saw one of my old Linux instructors, Grant Williams, uh, at Linux Fest Northwest this year. Oh, did year. you really? Yeah, I did, as a matter of fact. Uh, and I'll tell you what, Noah, if I would have had a resource like this, scenario-based labs, put you in the middle of everyday common tasks, so you get actual hands-on experience. Instructor mentoring is available for these complex topics. Everything around the Linux stack. Everything around it. I'm not just talking core fundamentals. Of course they have that, but they have all of the technologies that make Linux amazing. OpenStack, Docker, the firewall capabilities, routing, all of that. That is the core of Linux Academy. At linuxacademy.com slash coders is where you go. Go check out the graded server exercises, all of it. They have great courseware on Android development, Python, Ruby. Check them out, 7 plus distros to help customize your courseware. They have availability planners and all of it. LinuxAcademy.com slash coders. And a big thank you to Linux Academy for sponsoring the Coder Radio program. Maybe one day we'll see courseware on Swift, too, which is actually kind of where our next topic takes us, Mr. Domic. You had a blog post on the 10th, which I don't think we've had a chance to talk about. No, no, we haven't. And, oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening to me. <laughs> What's going on? It's almost as though a number of tech executives got together and are intentionally trying to troll me personally. Um, so I love Swift so much. Does that seem sincere? Yeah. Well, I, I seem to recall a certain Dominic, when he found out about Swift, almost had to rage quit. I, 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 I almost dropped the mic. It was, it was bad. No, it so was, how can we was... go from Swift is good and kai to that? Where did, where did I, where was the disconnect? Oh, I, I still hate Swift. I mean, I, I just want to be totally clear about that. <laughs> uh, How did I guess? Hmm. So, you know, I've been doing a lot of Android recently, mainly because it's in Java, and I can do it on Linux or Windows or whatever. What would screw that up for me, Chris? What would, what would really hmm. be the quickest way to piss me off? Well, uh, I could see Google doing something that might upset you. I could see that. Right. I, I but, could but, see. Uh, I could see um, the machine you're working on die and your workflow get all messed up. I could see. I mean, there's a few possibilities. Narrow it down for me, Mike. Narrow it down for me. Well, they could. Rumor has it, and it's been reported. It's one of those rumors that's been leaked enough now. Okay, that let me guess. I'm going to guess. Uh, rumor yes. has it that they're going to integrate Google Glass as an official wear accessory to Android, and you are upset. <laughs> that's what it is, right? And it automatically turns on at urinals. Yeah. <laughs> oh! Do you, uh, are you a Google Glass hater, Mr. Domine? <laughs> uh, I am not a fan. No, I, I don't. Although, to be fair, I don't have one because they were, you know, it was $1,600, and I was like, no. Um, so I, I would say, let's see. All right, let me check here. Uh, looking back, uh, pulling up Mike's. Uh, hey, uh, Noah, could you uh, pull that up and enhance that for me? Okay, all right, enhance. Uh, enhance. Yeah, okay, enhance. Okay. Uh, enhance. So uh, you have a history of being a Swift hater, and Google has a bit of a problem with Oracle and their use of some of Oracle's copywritten right. intellectual property. I'm gonna put the card up to my forehead right now. Uh, something that moves very quickly and has gained a lot of traction. Mr. Dominic, answer. Swift. You, okay, think, this, so you think this rumor is actually legit? Do you think that uh, Google could sit back from their competitive landscape perch and the, at the Alphabet headquarters and say, you know what? This Swift thing is so great, and our, our problem with Oracle is kind of annoying, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Wouldn't this just be the way to go? Let's move the Android platform. This is there any any possibility you think this rumor holds water? I think it's almost an absolute certainty. Really? I, I, because it. All right. So let's let's talk about. And I'm going to try to not be flame baited here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's, it's going to hurt. It's going to be hard, right? Okay. Okay. So so from a practical level, lawsuits are a big waste of time and money. No one really wins in a lawsuit, right? Google has been bled by Oracle over and over. I remember hearing about this when I was like in college, right? That Oracle was suing not Google but other people for all these crazy copyright and patent infringement crap. And then finally, Google was dumb enough to use Java, which, by the way, they were going to use C sharp because they're 
crazy and didn't want to take the one that actually had a license that they could legally use because it was Microsoft. They went with Java and they shot themselves in the face. Um, that aside. When they picked they, Java, though, it was, I mean, and it still is, well, it had such a huge developer base. I mean, right, it still, it still is, does. Yeah. So Java and Java also, you have to remember, put yourself back in the time. Right now, people take a shit on Java. They don't like Java. This is not a safe for work episode, by the way. Um, back at the time, Java was still popular, not just in quantity, but also in mindshare. So you have to understand that it was a different time back then, too, right? People sure. had this hope that Java would someday like have a baby with Scala and get better. In their mind, what is better? Um, so there's the hype train. That plus... I, I really don't understand why people like Swift, but it's it's so popular. I'm reading it on sites, and I'm there was something about Swift in the freaking Wall Street Journal. Well, I so I mean I think there is a lot of there's a lot of reasons why people like Swift. I'll, I, you know what? I'm just gonna flip to your side for a second and give you my reasons why I Go think. Ahead. And I I, got, I can walk both lines of this fence, but here's why Swift would make sense to me. You solve two big stigmas. First of yep. all, people don't, I mean, I, I don't know if I have a good sense of this. So this is my weakest argument, and I'll go with my, my other stronger argument next. But I don't know if people, when they, look at the, uh, when they look at the task of setting up a Android development system, and they look at the task of learning Java, I don't know, is that something pe- still appealing to people that are coming up into this space today? That- no, it's an easy setup. I mean, Android is one of the easier environments to okay. set up. I, I, I would say that the two reasons are the obvious legal one, which totally makes sense, right? And hype, right? Apple is I see no, I don't I don't think so. Hype. I don't think I don't oh. think Google would do this for hype. What I think it comes down to is you solve a huge huge problem that Android has. And this is this is actually really interesting that we're discussing this right now because I just spent uh, the last like five or six days on a Nexus 5X. I got a 5X and I put uh, started with M got kind of uh, disappointed in a couple of things at M went ahead and decided to try the uh, N beta and so I've been, you know, uh, Reinstalling a bunch of apps from the Play Store, kind of looking at what's out there. I've just really gotten a, a new sense of what the, what's out there on the Play Store, and uh, I think what this is, Mike, is this solves the huge problem you always hear: iPhone first. It doesn't completely solve it, but if you share, if 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 it's Swift for iPhone and now it's Swift Swift for Android, think about the barrier removed there. If you have one common language, not for only both that, platforms, Google is leveraging. Apple to do their heavy lifting then for their own platform. And all the marketing and hype that Mike is talking about right now. Mm-hmm. They can ride Apple's hype train and benefit from the mm-hmm. uh, from the developer base. You're going to have all these well, Objective-C developers for iOS transitioning to Swift, and now they just became Android developers too. Well, now, Michael, do you think that, that if, if, if something like that were to happen, though, that that becomes, then Android then just becomes the knockoff iPhone? Mm. Well, I, I think... Probably right. I mean, I'm not sure how effective that would be at attracting iOS developers to Android. If that's if that's really what they're trying to do. Well, but. hold on, hold on, because hold on now. Now you're leveraging your Swift skills. You're leveraging all of that work and ed- education, and you're not dealing with Apple's App Store. Yeah, you but, you but can take a- advantage of the Play API, which is not available on the Apple ecosystem. There's a lot of more. There's a lot of different hardware options. There's a lot more flexibility, and now Swift developers will have access to all of it. And Google just has to keep making that stuff more and more attractive. Yeah, you you guys are missing a huge thing here, right? Like, Swift is written with Coco sort of in mind, right? It's written with Apple's low-level compilation where, mm-hmm. you know, there's no bit code. There's LLVM compilation to hardware. Um, they have something they call bit code that's brought to us by the other bullshit. That's just something different, not the same thing as, like, Java bytecode. The architectural change Google needs to make, if unless they're going to have, like, you know, a Swift is just another interface into the Dovlik or the other VM. This is where, this is where I was going to go with it. That's right, kind of what I think. So, so the only way this really makes sense and is actually a net gain for developers, is if we are no longer working in Java-style VMs, if we're I working agree. straight up on the hardware uh, right compiled. This is but why think I think it's now, perfect. It's perfect it's, it's because suicide. it sucks for end users. There's no huge no. benefit to it. It makes it super easy for developers to write for Android, so it's an obvious choice for Google. Whenever they can do something that's inconvenient for users and makes their platform easy to adopt, they do it. I mean, look at Android. That's, and that is Android to a T. And I, People who are new to the show just think I'm some huge Android hater. 
This is an opinion that I've gotten to over years and years of thinking about this. From the very way it was implemented at the carriers, the way that they allowed carriers to manage the deal, to the reason they chose Java, to the way all of this works with right. the agreements with the OEMs, at every single time, Google makes concessions to increase adoption of the platform, even at the cost of the ideal solution. They Google are will, they are willing to compromise. But they are going to be taking a hell of an engineering feat on And they're Google. They can obviously do it. But... Maybe you know, they're just trying hat. to beat Microsoft to the punch. I bet Microsoft's working on the same thing. Well, I mean, I doubt it, right? Think about all the different com- the different processor platforms, the different GPUs on the Android ecosystem. Right now, there's a layer of abstraction because you're working all in VMs. You're absolutely correct that if they were to go down to native code, you know, the smooth scrolling that folks in the chat are talking about, you know, the fact that, Android apps tend to be a little more battery intensive than their equivalent iOS app. It does have something to do with you having to run a full VM for every app, right? Like mm-hmm. that's, that's how it works. Uh, is that worth it? I mean, what does Android gain? Uh, I mean, I would love it if it weren't Swift. And and I'm, I'm kind I of think it gains. Like, I think it gains applications um, faster. But, I mean, but the APIs are different. The frameworks yes, are different. You're right. The, and not only that. Yeah, there's like there's no framework. There's no framework on Android to build an interface or anything. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, no, no. They exist, right? But they're. I'm not even talking about the UI frameworks, but that's a huge uh, shit show on Android anyway. Just the the way. You know, Coco is more similar to .NET than it is to the Android SDK. So I don't know how you're going to take Apple's language and make it – you're yeah. going to have to write a whole new SDK. Well, uh, I have a link in the show notes to uh, a project okay. to get uh, – they call it the Swift Lib. It can be compiled on Android ARM 7 devices. And they've got, they've got Hello World running, written in Swift on Android. It requires an Ubuntu or Linux-like uh, environment with all the Android SDK stuff set up and all the Swift uh, stuff for Linux set up. But then you can run Hello World written in Swift on Android. Okay, but who wants this? <laughs> well, <laughs> Googs. I, I mean, you're not asking who wants Hello World, right? No, no, not. No, I'm asking. So, I mean, no, you're a big Android guy. Let's just take a step back for a second and say, do you honestly believe that by virtue of being written in Swift, these applications will be better? No. And, and to be and to be completely fair, I don't know if I'd say I'm a big Android guy. I'm a big, okay. I don't like anything available to me guy. Okay, fair enough. So, so Firefox OS then, huh? <laughs> Nothing available wishes, to me guy. He wishes. Yeah, yeah. He wishes, but no. He's, he still, at the end of the day, likes to make calls and uh, have apps that he needs to do his yeah, business. Yeah, right, right. How? An angel at Mozilla just died. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I would like to hear the audience's thoughts. Coderadio.reddit.com. I think it is not never going to happen. I really do. I was just trying to play devil's advocate there. I think it's never likely. I think first of all, uh, Google's got too many other great choices. Uh, they don't. They don't need Swift. Go. Go would be so much better. Exactly. And then also, uh, it's way, 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 way unlikely that they would make such a core strategic component of their operating system. Hitch to Apple. That seems like well, the last now, thing they're going to do. Uh, hang on. Their defense. Swift is MIT. So it's yeah, I understand. Digital. And nope. they, they obviously have no qualms about forking anything. But uh, it's still, it seems unlikely. There's just too much not invented here syndrome in Silicon Valley and even up in Mountain View. And there's, there's too much uh, strategy tax for decisions like that. I just could never actually seen it. And if they did it, I'd actually pretty be damn impressed. Yeah. Because it really would truly show that it is an actual open platform right. and not a strategy wedge and, and hammer that they just See, swing around. The, the, the scary part of the story, even if it's not true, right, is how just excited the tech media was who have no idea what the hell they're talking about by the way like you could you know the fellow who wrote in a couple weeks ago uh, last time i was on the air who doesn't agree with me on swift and gave me actual reasons why i might be wrong um very different position there seems to be and i i really haven't seen anything like this since java came out right a desire for Swift to be the answer to questions nobody's asked. Does that does that hmm. make sense? I, hmm. Well, I feel like I feel like there was definitely a group of Objective C developers who have been asking for a replacement. Yes, um, noobs. I understand, but they can just go back to working on VBasic. There are certain safeties that come with Swift that I think are appealing to a lot of developers. 
I, I don't know. I I can't say it hasn't been asked for because then you you could make the same argument for Rust or something like that. And it, there, uh, Rust is also a very fascinating I product. Would, although Rust is not replacing something that was already being done, right? Rust is actually allowing new things to be developed more efficiently. Mm-hmm. I would argue that Swift is just a one to one replacement for Objective C. Uh, there are, to my knowledge, there are no large scale applications that are <laughs> easier or quote, weren't possible in Objective-C before, right? But we, we should get off of this, right? Because, listen, no one's going to convince me to use to, to like Swift, right? You might convince me to use it, but... Look at this. For, there is the... Uh, huh. No. No! This is on the actual Swift GitHub here. Uh, this is a pull request that adds Android Target for the standard library. This is the first example of cross-compiling outside of Darwin. A Linux host machine builds for the Android Target. This is happening. Right. This is uh, this is happening, Mike. Yeah, I know. It's... And you know, it, uh, <laughs> what, what can Apple do? <laughs> you know what? This pleases me because they just is, they just went in so brazenly Apple. into open source, and now their new crown jewel no. is being ported to Android. It just no, it, it tickles is, me. If if that happens, that is only good for Apple. I, I agree. Now, I just wonder if they, they'll yeah. see it that way. I think it's they, great for Apple, but will they see it that way? Apple did not open source Swift to be nice. Apple did it because they want to influence the crop of upcoming developers. They want to influence uh, developing nations where people are, you know, new development, new markets, things like that. They want to control it. They, I hate to say it. They would like to be the Microsoft of the, you know. So what you're 20- telling me is given enough time, Swift will be the new Java. Wrong. I'm right saying, once, it, hold on. Right once, you can run it on Linux, Mac, iOS, Android, I probably Windows. I don't know. And you know what's even more quaint about it? It's likely if it's running on Android, I'm going to be running still under a VM. So it's really just like Java. It'll be the new VBasic. <laughs> okay, you're right. It'll be the new. V- all right, you're right about that. Uh, uh, okay, all right. Well, you know what? Yeah. Uh, I know the next topic is going to get. Is going to get a lot of discussion, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna clear out a little space with some block storage over at DigitalOcean, DigitalOcean.com. Use our special promo code Coder Digital one word to get a credit, about ten bucks. You can try out their five dollar week two months for free, and you support this show. DigitalOcean is amazing. So it's a simple cloud hosting provider that makes it simple and very fast to get your Linux box spun up in seconds. I challenged Noah to spin up a Linux rig on the live stream yesterday at uh, Linux Fest. I like how you have appropriated my idea. When, when he says he challenged me to spin up a Linux rig, what he means to say oh, was, you I was challenged like, yourself. I was going to say, I was like, I, so I was like, all right, let's in my see. defense, I got in on that stuff. You did. I had music playing. I was, I was. Yeah. Which I actually kind of, sh- which actually kind of oh, like what's detracted. The matter? Did it shake your game? Well, no, because then it t- like it took three and a half minutes rather than two minutes, and the yeah. music timed out at two minutes, and yeah. then it's like, oh yeah. no, a fail. But then we forgot that we just spun up. Not only did we spin up the server, yeah. but we configured an entire streaming backend which, in three and a half includes minutes. Includes Nginx and all. Which, by the way, saved your podcast for the rest of the there week. There you go. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh, DigitalOcean.com. You can get started for any task you might need. It's great performance, fast bandwidth, tier one data centers in New York, San Fran, Singapore, Amsterdam, London, Toronto. Germany. Did you do a San Fran uh, spin San up? Francisco. Yeah. yeah, when you're here on the West Coast, that just makes so much you know, sense. I will tell you though, in my experience, the San Francisco data center has the most issues. If, yeah. if I have, like, if I'm not doing something specifically for JB, I'm usually putting them in New York. Well, that's because you're all the way on the East Coast. If oh, you're on, I'm, the, I'm, I'm in the center of the United States. Well, you're pretty much on the East Coast. I tell you what, everything's because all the everything West, east of Washington it's, is it, the East it's Coast. Not, it's not the data center so much; it's the it's the transit yeah, in between. That's true. But we go and, through Chicago, and I go uh, when I'm on the West. Like I go to see that I do the same thing. I do West Coast because yeah. it's like flawless for me, mm-hmm. right? And so this is what I love about the fact they have data centers everywhere. Like, and some of them, like the ones in Germany. Oh man, dude, that thing is perfectly located. It's got 40 gigabit e connections to each hypervisor. Mm-hmm. You start with a freaking terabyte. Of bandwidth, yeah. Which, since we're streaming video right now to like four different destinations through our DigitalOcean droplet, uh, we really appreciate that. Plus, they have a great interface, really intuitive and simple and straightforward, with a great API too that has a ton of apps, including a new command line utility built around their API, so you can manage all your droplets right from your terminal, or like in a script. They also have guides now for upgrading your droplets to Ubuntu 16.04. They have. Oh, look at this! They also have one on just what's new in Ubuntu 16.04. Wondering why you should upgrade? Oh. Yeah, if you've been on 14.04, there's some changes. Yeah, you should probably know about some of these. <laughs> yeah, and they have a great write-up over at DigitalOcean. So use our promo code Coder Digital. Get a $10 credit, spin up your rig, DigitalOcean.com, and a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Coder Radio. 
program. So, Mr. Dominic, do you want to start with your new rig, or do you want to start with the switching adventure? I don't know how it all blends, but I'll let you uh, take oh, it. Well, all right. So, Noah, you, you will be proud of me. Hold on. I'm going to crack one open for this segment. All right. Go ahead. Don't worry. It's just a Coca-Cola. As you may or may not know, Noah, I have been running Linux on a VM on my Mac, but I'm a little tight on storage. Okay. So I went ahead and I had a spell, uh, spell, spare, one of those little Dell Inspiron towers, the crappy little tiny ones. Yeah. And I threw a Ubuntu 1510 on there. Okay. U- using it for my home office, I was pretty happy. But, you wow. Know, I, was coming to, I was coming to work every day, still working on my Mac, uh, Mac Pro, actually. <laughs> So I said, you know what? I got a coupon from the Microsoft store. This is the first mistake. And it was $200 off a non-touch Dell XPS 13. Okay. Ooh. Great. So I bought one. And I was so excited that I ordered next day shipping. Took me three and a half hours to place the order. That was fantastic. Oh, man. Dell has a horrible site. Yeah, it was Microsoft, actually. Oh. <laughs> well, I don't know about their they, they They didn't understand that my bank was not one of the major three banks, apparently. Oh, yeah, that could uh, be a problem. Yeah, so my bank kept declining the charges, so it was yeah. great. Yeah. And finally, we get it sorted out. They, they ship it out. It was awesome. I get it. So it's a signature edition, right? So it's loadable windows. Right. I get my uh, Dell 1510 USB key, pop it in there, run it all as well for about two minutes. Okay. I realize that the Broadcom drivers that are available oh, yeah. are not correct for my Wi-Fi. Right. And after about an hour and a half of searching, was told that actually if I just go to the uh, Ubuntu 1604, at the time it was the one of the final betas, mm-hmm. or maybe it was the release candidate, I'm not sure. Uh, they have a driver, and that's the only way to get this driver. Mm-hmm. You know what? Fine. I, I kind of wanted to do Ubuntu Mate anyway, so I went ahead and I got the Mate 1604. It's important to know that at work, I plug my laptops into an external monitor. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Working beautifully. I was loving Mate. I is this the, uh, by the way, real quick, was, is this the high-resolution XPS, or is it 1920 by 1080? No, it's the high-res one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's... Uh, and, yeah, and, Mata, newest... and Mate did okay with that? Yeah, it's the one you have right there on the screen, actually, 799. Yeah. 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 So everything's fine. You know, great. Turns out that Uh-oh. there is an Intel Skylake driver problem. Yes. That when not plugged into an external monitor, right. it cannot render the screen and flickers every, I yep. would say, five to 20 we, And you and yeah. I went back and forth of this on you Twitter. Were, yes, yes, we did. And then we tagged Popey, who works for Canonical in, who said it's an upstream bug. And yep. uh, so basically just live with it. And but the problem is, is we have Skylake machines in studio. Right. And we have not had that upstream. Right. And I have. Uh, and I, I also have had older versions of, of Ubuntu where I have not had that issue on Skylake. Uh, I have not tried mirroring the display because I know yours didn't show up until you mirrored Chris. Oh, yeah, for mine? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I didn't have any problems on my Skylake Ubuntu install until I hooked up a second display and then I started having problems. So yeah. I have no problems when the second display is hooked up and it only has the problem if I'm running it as a laptop. Oh, this yeah. is super frustrating. You know, and the, the thing is, the Sputnik edition uh, of the Dell laptop, I'm not sure if it's immune of the Intel problem, but it definitely doesn't have the wireless problem. Right. And so, and but, it, but it's like $300 more than that discount that he got, or maybe $400 Yeah, it, it would have been a sig- – I mean, I wouldn't have bought it. It's really good. So, so, yeah, yeah, right. So I, I guess the first thing that comes to mind, Michael, is uh, if, that, if I were in your situation, the first thing I would do is I would go to Amazon, and I would just order a, uh, an Intel PCI AC card. Um because it's going to cost you like 35 bucks. And the problem with, even if you can get it working, every time you reload this machine, you're going to, you're, you are going to, you're going to get to a point where it's like, oh, oh yeah, that doesn't work. And then you're going to have to deal with, you know, getting those drivers again and again and again, which is kind of a pain. So, yeah. so uh, right here in studio, we have an XPS 13. In fact, this is what Noah's using right now. And uh, this XPS 13, Mike, I did the same thing. I wanted to get a review of this fast, so I bought the Windows version, and uh, this, yep. the Linux version wasn't on sale yet. And it's been, it's been, it's identical now to the Linux version because I did the same thing. I went on Amazon and I just, I bought a replacement 
I, I got to make sure you get the right one. Yeah, because there's a couple different shapes. Th- there are, but it, most any anything made by Intel would pretty much work out of the box. And I think it was like thirty four or forty bucks. Right. Yeah. So it's not super expensive. Yeah, and so you I, just replace the card and it fix the. Yeah, and it's two right screws there the, and two wires. Yeah. yeah so uh, yeah, just be careful with the wires because they can break. I did break mine. Uh, so yeah, it's like it's like ha- it's like five, six, seven screws to get the bottom plate off of the laptop, and then it's right there on the bottom. Yeah, I did a hard drive upgrade on mine, so I've already oh yeah taken a okay yeah oh, there you go. So the, the reason why I did that, even though I know I could get the Broadcom working, right. is I I just never want to like you reloaded that this weekend, right? And you didn't multiple have to times, multiple times we yeah. reloaded it, and this you weekend. didn't have to worry about it once. It right. just works every time, and that's that's what if I'm reloading my rig, sometimes I'm in a rush, and I don't want to have to fight yeah. that stuff. So wait, just to be clear, getting that that Intel card on Amazon that fixed the Broadcom problem or that fixed the screen flickering? Problem? We'll fix the the this, the Broadcom problem. I'll, I'll be very honest with you, and this is something that Chris is. I, I know he's going to start dancing around the studio and screaming like a little girl when I say this, but I have uh, over this weekend. I think I have become convinced that Antergos is is. Uh, it's really a better distro to. I, well, at least I think we're getting a lot of feedback. I don't know if you yeah, see my somebody, twi- my Twitter somebody feed. Said that to me too. But yeah. we're getting a lot of feedback that 1604 wasn't ready to ship. It was. It has been a disaster, Michael. And I, and I have been used. And I this entire week, the entire week, I have to be, like, like look right now, right now. Oh, there it pops up. My my menus weren't showing up, and this is that's just one of the many problems I've been having on 1604. Yeah. And yeah. and it has uh, you know the whole week I've been defending 1604, yeah. and I've gotten to a point where I, the, I this is barely usable. Here's what I can't I, install here's what I'm starting to suspect, and this is just my own bias coloring this opinion. So take that into consideration. Consideration, but what this feels like to me is this feels like too many too many uh, things going on. We're working on special projects with Microsoft to get Bash on Windows. We're working on mobile at Mobile World Congress right. and uh, and shipping a, a tablet with BQ right as the LTS is about to release. Like right as the LTS is about to release, yeah. we have a brand new tablet that we had to delay a couple of weeks. So that way we could fix up the image to get it out the door. It feels like what happened was is even though 1604 had a long time to bake. The la- like some of the like the the swap issues and stuff like that weren't fixed until just days before released. It was banged yeah. together and thrown out the door to meet and the it, deadline. And you know they sent everyone was quick to write in and tell us the swap issues are fixed. I actually ran into that the first. Well, the ISO, bugs marked as closed. I mean, that's great. The first ISO that I downloaded from the main site as it got published and went up, I ran into the same problem. Well, here's where I'm, and here I'm not trying to say Antigros or Arch is better than Ubuntu because I I bet if you give it three months. 1604, 01, or 02 will be out, and like that entirely a, destroys the purpose of an LTS to me. I know, but I just yeah, I, that's, but that's in like kind of garbage, yeah. right. But here's right. why I think perhaps Anna Gross has a leg up at this very moment, and and what I'm saying is in two three months this advantage might be erased by future uh, 1604 updates. Mm-hmm. But because they aren't hitting arbitrary release dates, they are just packaging upstream rolling stuff right. and putting out ISOs as they have enough collective stuff to fix. There's no release day. There's no. There's no deadline. There's no stress there. It's when this when the product has gotten good enough to cut a new yeah. ISO, we cut a new ISO. And that over the last two years iteratively has led to a really good polished distro. Yeah. And I think it's par- partly because they're not hitting arbitrary release dates. And if something distracts them for a little while and they decide to go retool something, they don't then all of a sudden bang something out just to make sure they hit the. Day. Yeah, this is this is really kind of shaken my 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 worldview on Linux because, you know, I'm and I, I kind of think I, I feel like from the, the the basic things that I'm getting from you, Michael, is that uh, we, you and I are kind of of similar mindsets in that you know we're you're essentially you're looking for a Linux distro to just install and then work on, and you're not really interested in playing with it or or, or doing other stuff. You just you need to be able to get work done first, and yeah, and then I we take your second. Playing with it. Yeah. Right, and so and what I'm finding this week is that. The distro that for forever I have seen, I think a lot of other people see as the distro for people that want to tweak and play, I have found those to be, at least in this last week, blowing the the, the blowing out of the water the LTS and, and and I understand that they will eventually get those problems sorted, but Antergos will eventually get all their problems sorted really, too. Really, I think to be a successful Arch user, it requires that you update your packages once every week or two. Mm-hmm. Uh, and maybe uh, maybe more frequently than that if you have time, mm-hmm. and maybe check the Linux Action Show subreddit from time to time to see if there's any Arch news. Right. And that's because pr- every like three times a year, there's a package upgrade where you need to migrate from one Linux technology to another Linux. T- like you know, right. it very rarely happens actually. And it would happen just automatically if you update, right? Yeah, but every now and then there might be some course of action you might need to take depending on your system. Mm-hmm. But that always when that happens is such big news that it's usually on any standard Linux news. Uh, outsource, including our own shows, because it so rarely happens. Yeah. 
Uh, so it, to me, uh, the the threat of the big threats I hear are my software's changing out from underneath me. My right. interfaces are changing constantly. Right. Uh, I don't want my system to be one way one day and another way the next day. Yeah. Those are my common. Those are the common uh, re, 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 retor- retorts or whatever to Arch. And my response to all of those is: you control when you do the update. Just maybe do it a little more frequently since it's rolling software. Uh, the targets, like the big ones, where like the UI changing, those are usually like the GNOME desktop getting updated. And honestly, don't you want that? Don't you want a nice new interface? If you don't, install Mate. Like it's all dependent I, on which desktop you install. I, so I, that's not a valid argument either. I'd, I'd make a challenge to you, Michael. I'd say if you, when we get off the air, if you go download the Antergos installer and install Antergos Mate, it's going to look exactly like Ubuntu. Mate. Well, actually, it doesn't. It's a little different. But so Pacmatic uh, is being recommended in the chat room to stay on top of breaking changes. Well, in well, 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 hang on though, right? So let's just take it a step back because I got a very passionate defense from a couple of Ubuntu guys that this is not an Ubuntu problem. This I've is a that. Linux kernel problem. That's what yeah, they say. No so here's here's how it works with the different distros. Uh, th- I'm going to give you this is a, so in yeah, Ubuntu yeah, yeah. in Ubuntu it's never an Ubuntu problem. It's an upstream problem. In By open, the way, in I, open, I just want to pause you guys. If you're trying to convert people who are doing Dev on Mac, and we've already gone this far into I know. internal politics, it's a losing game, right? I know. Like, I know. I, I just, honestly thought about just returning it. I'm, I'm just saying. We keep going. Keep okay. Going. So really yeah. quickly, Ubuntu always blames upstream. It's never Ubuntu's fault. OpenSUSE always says, we have the best solution. We've engineered around it. And Fedora always says, well, the next time we do it, we're going to build a better version. Isn't that, that, that's it, so accurate. That is so accurate. Yeah. So that's, so accurate. That's, what, that's just, and, and the arch response is, oh, well, you can make it work. That's the arch response. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, you're, you're right. Do, do me a favor. Just before you before you return it, at least try, just install Antragos, if nothing more oh, than yeah, a thought experience. Yeah. yeah. And and then yeah. if after and you three can days. Just, uh, the installer will ask you which desktop environment you want. And, and just, ap- after three days, if all of your problems aren't solved, the ones that you have, even including the Broadcom and the display, even without swapping the wireless card, if all those problems aren't solved in uh, just by installing it, then consider returning it. Yeah, the wireless might be your one. But even, like, I had that, that Mac that we had. Yeah. As long as you have a hardwired connection, when you yes. install it, it yes. pulls down the Broadcom yes. driver. See, the Anagros, that's the one thing, is Anagros installer does require that you have an active internet connection because it's literally pulling down the most recent packages well, I, during I, install. I can tether a phone. Yeah. Right? Or, yeah, you, or, yeah, if you have Ethernet, if, uh, Ethernet USB adapter, that works perfectly. E- either way, Mike, uh, I think, I think, yeah, you're right. The core, that is a core issue. Uh, uh, and Noah, you remember when we talked to Richard Brown, mm-hmm. I was talking to him, oh, you weren't there, it was Brian that was sitting with me. <clears throat> When I was talking to Richard Brown, one of the OpenSUSE chair people, and uh, he's on Linux Plug- Unplugged all the time, uh, I was telling him, you know, I hear from Mike and we hear from developers that write in all all the time that there's a, a few core issues with developing software for Linux. One is what uh, what toolkit do I use? Mm-hmm. Two is what's the language I should use? Like, do I you know do I do Python? Do I do Ruby? Do I do C? Uh, and then how the hell do I distribute that software to my end users? Let alone make any money off it. Uh, right. And uh, I'm just, you know, I, I, I think that's where where Mike gets hung up. I don't know. Do you have a response to like? Because that's a common. I think Mike, that's a pretty good summary of some of the core issues, right? Yeah, I mean, for me, in order, it's right. It's stability of the system because ultimately, most of the time, I'm working on on some sort of Android or, or web project, um, so I can't be fixing my workstation constantly. Uh, the other thing was, I would like to write my own tools. And what is the quote unquote blessed toolkit? for someone who's not familiar with the platform, right? Like Integros would be totally foreign to me. So when I download and install Integros tonight or tomorrow, um, I'm going to have no idea what I'm looking at. You know, it's really sad because that is the promise of the LTS. That is the promise of Ubuntu LTS is that it is the program, it is the operating system that you download and install, and it just works out of the box. If you want to tweak, you can, but out of the box, you're going to have a really decent experience. Well, so Shri... Stop by the booth. Remember our conversation oh, yeah. with Shri, mm-hmm. and uh, I talked to Shri about this, and he's he's looking at uh, a a real final silver bullet solution, and they're specifically talking about desktop packaging. It's not a server sol- solution. It's they're talking about using sandboxed applications to deliver software. You write it once, and it runs on all Linux desktops. And we basically have all. He says we have all the fundamental technologies. They're launching a conference in September to sort of bring. The GNOME group together, devel- distro packages together, application developers together, and they're gonna they're gonna meet at this first conference in September. They're planning to have it in Portland to hash out like an official way. And Mike, you should watch the interview because it's in uh, this week's last. He specifically says we're trying to develop a channel for people to make money on software on Linux. 
<clears throat> oh, but Noah doesn't like that. I know that. No, I, oh, no, 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 no. I make tons of money. <laughs> I make my whole living off of making people off money off of Linux. I'm, I, I think everyone should make their money off of Linux. Uh, I, uh, I think that. Um, you, when you get paid to write an application, uh, you know, and we can have we can agree to disagree, but I think if if somebody pays to write an application, they should have the right to that code, so that if the developer is no longer involved or disenfranchised or something, they can continue to use the program or have it modified. Um, yeah, yeah, but I yeah. definitely think that uh, that you should be making money and charge if you have a good skill set. Don't give it away for free. So it's funny because I, I heard the episode you did last week and. Is that a common thing that developers approach you with that you'll pay them but you won't own the co- the IP all the time? Yeah, I mean, I've I... never had a contract like that. Oh, in, really? In almost ten years now, no, no, no one's sane would sign that contract. Uh, well, <laughs> I, well, I guess I, I mean, so to clarify, no, nobody. I mean, if I won't pay people, I won't even have a discussion if we're not talking about releasing an open source. So I have never been in that situation, oh, but I have, sure. but I okay. have worked with companies that have hired a company to write software, and that company owned the software and wrote it for the business, but the business didn't own the soft, software. The software company did. That's just the ripoff right that's like that's selling the skew really is it's you have a, a small template or a small prepackaged solution and you say oh we're yeah. customizing it yeah for that's, you. that's exactly really? that's exactly what yeah. it was yeah really you're just a consulting shop who doesn't want to admit that they're a consulting shop i mean that's that that is 100 percent accurate yeah uh, so, uh, so from that, per- that, that, that perspective, I think that, uh, but as far as making money, no, I completely agree with making money and I make a lot of money off of, uh, off of people using Linux. All right. Fair enough. All right. So I will take your challenge. I'm on the Integros page. This looks like a, almost like a kind of material design thing we've got going on here. They have a couple different, <clears throat> I'm not a, you know, their, their look is nice. It's clean. Um, it's a little outdated. I usually change it, but, uh, it's a good first impression if you go with the GNOME desktop to see the new GNOME desktop. Okay. Uh, and but they also have they also have all yeah. of them. Uh, I think what you would find is if you go down this path, you'll discover. Well, there's like there's like as you've noticed, there's like the canonical path you can take to deliver software as snap Which packages. Which used to be the stable path, by the way. Right, and but you know, like, in yeah. the future, it's going to be Qt yeah. and QML yeah. and Qt Creator and snap packages. Right, that is a very canonical, and you're going to be making sure it works on Mirror. Mm-hmm. And you're going to make sure that it works in a touch UI mode and in a desktop orientation mode, maybe a tablet mode too. Right. That's a very Ubuntu-specific workflow. Mm-hmm. Uh, if On Antergross, your workflow is going to be more GTK or QT still, but it's, it's more – it's like everything but Ubuntu. Yeah. It's for all Linux, and you'll probably still be able to run right. that on Ubuntu. Uh, and I think now what all what they're going to do at this conference is basically they're they're going to come up with a software delivery mechanism for all of Linux, and I think it's actually going to happen now because we have so many of the fundamentals already shipping. Mm-hmm. There's XDG app. Uh, there's GNOME Builder now. Have you checked out GNOME Builder, Mike? It's not like amazing, but it's uh, it's nice. It's the guy. They've really done a lot of work. It actually is kind of amazing for how much work that's been done on GNOME Builder already, and uh, it's really easy to install that kind I of stuff. It. Yeah. yeah, check it out. I just did a little. I'm doing a little Goog search. Um, <clears throat> there is a lot to jump into, so I don't know how 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 successful you'll find yourself. One of the core things is about Arch is similar to how BSD works. There is the core operating system packages, and then there's the Arch user repository. This extra u- user curated application repository that has everything in it. So last night when we were working with uh, with the kid on his MacBook, he was looking for this. Um, what was it called? PyCharm. Uh, PyCharm, yeah. And he says, "I said, all right. So I'm going to show you how to use Packer." And he says, "No, no, 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 no. It won't be in any of the repositories. You'll have to go to the website and download it." I'm like, "Eh, let's search Packer first. Make sure it's not in the AUR." And he goes, "No, you don't understand. This software is not published anywhere. It's it's only going to be available from the download site. We'll have to download and then we'll have to install." It. I'm like, "Well, let's try Packer Tech SS." Python, and he looked at it, at the results on the screen, goes, is that right? And hands it to Adam. Adam looks at it and goes, yeah, yeah, that's what you want. Yeah. And not only do we install it, not only do they have the community edition, they have the professional edition that you have to pay for. Yeah. So he, you know, he had to put his credentials and yeah, stuff. But yeah, they'll have the binary. Like, so like if, they have, if they release a Linux version and you can do an HTTP download of it, there'll often be a, a Pac-Man build of it. Because right. you can pull it from their website, exactly. which is great because then the developer still gets the download count. Yep. They're pulling the actual binary released by the developer, and then you just enter your serial number in when you launch the application like right. you normally would. Yeah, it was, it was it, I think it was, I think it was mind-blowing and then it was you know he has experience in the terminal and so 
At first, I was a little worried about trying to show him Packer, um, and I went to do some. Oh, I went. To, I think we went to install graphic drivers. He's like, "Why don't we just do this from the command line? It'll be easier for me." And and then you know, and he's he's you know he's piping things to less and more and looking at how the system is built and stuff. And I'm like, "Oh yeah, you're gonna do fine on Linux." Yeah. So Mike, when you install it, there'll be an option to enable the Arch user repository, and I would go ahead and do right. that because it'll give you a tool called Yort. Uert, that will allow you to take advantage of the Arch user repository. And that's where you'll install things like Dropbox from, Google Chrome, all of that stuff. You don't have to you don't have to go download any packages. You don't go to any website. It's all in the Arch user repository. And there's a website that you can for the Arch user repository. You can go if you prefer to search online. And the nice thing about that is you get votes and user comments which will help troubleshoot if it doesn't build properly, or it just it's a nice vetting process where the community is actively vetting sources to making sure everything's in compliance and builds correctly. So it's really kind of cool. It's so it's it's ended up being like the largest software repository available for Linux. Mm-hmm. Not everything works, and you know it also everything you install from there has to be updated with a, with a management tool and all that stuff. But I can I can help you with that as you get there. I think you might find it interesting. It's a, it's a. I think it's a better way to Linux because it's like taking advantage of the actual package management system completely. Well, and it also it's more true to the Linux spirit. It's more true for the Linux design, and it doesn't try to put Linux into a box it was never meant to put in. I think, and I think that's kind of what makes it stand yeah. out. And I don't think it's particularly conducive to people yeah. that are coming over from operating systems <coughs> that are in a box. And that that has yeah. been for the longest time my yeah. biggest. Back. Here's and here's why I say Anagros over Straight Arch is because it's a combination of a lot of nice things. The Anagros project uh, working at their own pace to iteratively improve the product over time, and it's right. just the installer is just top notch. It's got a couple of things every now with partitioning, but it's just a top notch installer mm-hmm. that lets you do advanced stuff, including ZFS support, right there in the GUI. Uh, so it's got a top notch installer. Arch itself has a fantastic repository with all of the software you pretty much would want available f- to install from the command line or their super crappy GUI tool. Uh, and at least for me, the reason why I use GNOME mm-hmm. or Mate or Plasma Desktop over Unity, mm-hmm. all the GNOME project does is work on GNOME. All the Plasma project does is work on the Plasma project. Like that's their core purpose. That's what they do. That's yeah. their function, yeah. right? Unity is one of many, 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 many things Canonical is working on. And it has shown. It has really not gotten much attention for a long time. That's why when you install applications in Ubuntu, they don't show up in the menu. That's not new. Yeah. That's, that, well, it's new for me. I have not had that problem. Center, not installing devs. That's, I, 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 I've been using GitDebI for years because of see, that problem. I have not had that problem in the past. Now, it I've is had, an ongoing issue. And the thing is, just one, real quick to complete the thought, mm-hmm. GNOME isn't perfect. Plasma Desktop isn't perfect. They're not there yet in some regards, but it's all they do is work on them. Yeah. So you, when you install GNOME on top of Anagros, you get a desktop environment that is gorgeous because all the developers do is work on that one thing. You right. get a distro that is iterative and has been improving for years on top of a rolling distribution with an enormous software repository. Well, and the other thing is, too, is, the, you know, Antergos takes it takes the line of working with the community instead of against them. So you take your GNOME example, for example. You have people from the Fedora project, from Red Hat, from OpenSUSE, from Antergos, from all these distros that are utilizing GNOME are all contributing, giving feedback, opening right. bug reports, right. all that kind of thing. Only Ubuntu is working Only on Ubuntu Unity. Only Ubuntu Unity users. Yeah. And and I, I don't care what anyone says. The, the reality is I, I don't meet a lot of Unity yeah. users. And so, now, all right. So we've gone off the rails, Mike, but I just, I just wanted to give you, like, that's, I, uh, you're right in the sense that story apple.com is a lot easier <laughs> but uh, it is also like it is an interesting it is an interesting conundrum to just sort of look at uh, from like a software development platform standpoint I'm gonna open store.noahswitchme.com. <laughs> just that should be a thing yeah uh, so I don't know if we've helped you at all with your rig you'll probably either well, you remember my goal is going in right so I'll, I'll definitely give uh, Integros a shot there my goal is going we're basically to have a unix like workstation that didn't cost a billion dollars every time you needed to replace a part right and so, you know one of the other things mike too and i don't i don't like building pcs <laughs> i i just yeah. you know i've done that for years all my all my first computers for you know high school on up to my mid to late 20s were all custom builds and if it wasn't you know a, a mac for production and I just stopped doing it since then. And just recently, we've done we've done three builds. Now I didn't have to do them; no, I had to do them. <laughs> and Rikai. And once you bought proper parts, they yeah. work just fine. Yeah, but there is uh, there is a real nice freedom in saying, "All right, well, I want 
<clears throat> I want one hard drive for my operating system mm-hmm. and my applications, mm-hmm. and that's going to be that's going to be one of those PCI SSD M dot like type uh, yeah. right on the motherboard. Mm-hmm. And then I want one part. I want one SSD, a cheapo that I get off Newegg for Dropbox sync thing and BitTorrent. So, you know those crappy services that just trash my disk all the time, and you know like just dump storage for stuff and maybe some Steam games. I'm just going to dump them on that drive. Uh, and then this so this drive here, this third drive, this is this third drive, this cheap third drive, like 256 gigs, is going to be my home partition. It's going to be my home drive, my entire home drive, and I I I love. I love being able to just be a little flexible like that. If I want an extra USB card because I actually prefer to have my USB devices on different uh, controllers, I can add a USB card. And yet, I still have, I think, a really well-designed uh, Unix-level, if you will, uh, workstation. So I know it's really crazy, but once you get there, it's really kind of nice to have that sort of flexibility and not be locked into anybody's particular strategy tax. And that's almost another reason to step away from Ubuntu on its own is... One of the downsides of Windows and Mac OS is there is that latent strategy tax that's always tugging the platform in a certain direction. And Canonical is doing the same exact thing with the Ubuntu desktop. And that sometimes is the most frustrating thing Mm -hmm. when you just want to get your work done. But now your start menu has uh, flipping boxes that move all around all the time and, and distract you because that's the new design. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I look at that and I think it's worth it if you if you can if you can navigate it all. Yeah. At least for your own workstation. For long term work. Well give it a shot, Michael. Yeah, I feel like we scared him away and now he's gonna go buy Mac. Store.noahswitchme.com. Yeah. Yeah. Uh so uh check it out. Try you could try Mate or uh try Gnome if you want to be Craig Cray. You might prefer you might prefer Mate, actually. Um and if you really want to keep the laptop, you might want to get the Intel wireless. And then when you get Anagros, Mike, go check out Gnome Builder, too. The IDE for Gnome that's focused on bringing the power of the Gnome platform to developers. And this is really where they're kind of investing in sort of like, this will be like, the, the I think they want this to be the tool eventually for delivering applications to all Linux desktops. That's my, my sense of it. So I know it's not there, it's early. But uh, the sandboxing stuff and the X, XDDG app stuff that they're working on, um, all that, I think... Uh, because the developer behind Gnome Builder is one of the developers behind that effort, I think the two will be very closely linked as it grows. It can also work as a, by the way, Noah, as a, a Markdown uh, editor. Yeah, it supports even Markdown. Are you, uh, How about are you implying something? No, I'm just letting you know. If you oh, wanted okay. a native Markdown, uh, non-Electron style app, uh, you, could, uh, you could do that. Mr. Dominic, is there anything else you want to cover in this week's uh, Linux radio? Yeah, I know. No, uh, I think we covered everything. Uh, so, are you are you abandoning the Switch as your primary desktop? It sounds like it's kind of back to the Mac. Back to know, the Mac as the main machine. He, here's here's the problem. In, in the realm of reality, my son's going to be born Wednesday. Um, yeah, I'm told by those wiser than me that if I'm going to do something like this, it has to happen before then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. man. If that isn't the truth, although I will tell you this, Michael, I yeah. have found. I took up gaming as my uh, every every iteration of my child has been a different like. You mean each thing. time a child is born? Yeah, e- e- every iter- yeah. I get well. There are iterations in a story, but uh, <laughs> versions. Every version of my child that is born, I have taken on uh, something new. And and this last thing is gaming because what you find is like mom needs a break. You know, every every now and then, if you can take baby for a little bit, you can't move around very much. Like you're kind of stuck someplace. But if you can find, especially if you can work with one hand and you can hold the baby with the other. No, dude, get a sling. Yeah, the sling works in the baby. Oh man, yeah, that like the Dylan, baby Bjorn kind of thing. Dylan was having a tough time when he was a newborn. When uh, he was real young, and uh, I did all the editing, and I edited it late at night. Sure. So Andrew would go to bed. I'd put Dylan in the sling, yep. play a little Ronald Jenkins. There you go. And I'd work, and you know, they like it. They like yeah. it uh, kind yes, of they tight do. because it's it keeps them comfortable, and you yep. know, you're, and they regulate their breathing off of whoever's holding them. And my belly's warm. But you, uh, but that that's one thing too is like a lot of times I found myself going start cravingly nuts. If I just tried to sit and watch the baby, now I found if I just took a laptop and did small little projects, yeah. that'd be a great time to yeah. play with Andrew. Yeah, actually. actually, that laptop is great yeah. for that, uh, especially if mom needs to sleep for a bit, which is always a good move whenever you can do that because baby needs to eat a lot when they're when they're brand new. So you might find you might be surprised. Um, well, I think what I'm going to do 
Yeah, I think what I'm going to do is, you know, I'm going to give Integros a shot. Maybe I'll do it tonight. Integros. If if the Integros, see, papi. <laughs> if the drivers all work, then great. If they don't, I've invested a ton of time yeah. into this. Though. I would say, say if, it, if you can, yeah. if you have a USB Ethernet, plug that guy in. Yeah, he'll have to. Yeah, because you'll need yeah, that. You'll need a connection. You'll have. You'll we'll have. See you know, where it goes. All those driver things that can, that's contingent to it being connected to the internet to begin with. It'll probably yeah, tell I you to go take a walk if you don't. But yeah. yeah. Well, Mr. Dominic. Thanks, uh, Intel. Also, we should mention that over at dominicm.com, you do have a blog post about some of the Skylake issues you ran into. Yeah. yeah. All of that. So, did you run yeah. Windows 10 on there for a bit? Uh, it's actually running Windows 10 now. I recovered it to the recovery disk that I had to make because, God forbid, Dell print me a disk. Um, and I have to say Steam is nice. Yeah. Have you tried uh, Bash? Have you done no, the Ubuntu but, thing? Apparently, you have to turn on preview builds and then mm. do a rain dance. And at some oh, point... Oh, right. It, it's not that bad. It's not, I did it once. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, you log into... You have to create a Microsoft account. Or yeah, you probably have you, one. You I did. didn't. But uh, you log in and you turn out. You're right. You turn that on and then it just shows up in programs and features as a, as a beta. Oh, I thought you had to have... But don't you have to update your OS to like a newer version of Windows? Like a like on a preview fast yeah, track yeah. thing or something? All I did was I, I enabled it in. I'm trying to think. I enabled it in the account, and then I went into programs and features. What did you enable in the account? The that's uh, what you enabled, Noah. It's a preview track, insider yeah, builds, they call it. That. So they have. So they. So they, and then because you're logged into your Microsoft account on the Windows 10 box, it's right. then linked to that setting, and then you get a Windows update that you, updates you, it, or it do you. Just, it shows up in programs and features. So there's not even like a patch that has to come down. From like, if it does, it comes cool. in the background. Cool, that it does good. in the background. Yeah, I one one thing I'm finding is I'm trying to do some dev on Windows, and it is not the happiest place on earth. Good. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, I have to say, like, it, if all else fails, it's just back to the Mac at this point because. Ooh, we, we, you well, know what? Well, if anything's gonna push you over the edge, it'll be Anagross. If anything, it, well, it, you'll it, either love it or you'll gonna run push away. you over the edge. It's gonna be Noah flying to New York, and well, uh, well, uh, and uh, either I babysit your kid or I help set up your laptop. I say this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, just uh, remember one thing: the Arch Wiki is actually very, very, very good. It's some of the best documentation on the web for any Linux. So if you have any questions, just preface it with Arch, and then the thing you're having a problem with, you'll, there'll probably be something on it. And if you take a little tar- time to like install something like Packer, so uh, oh, here's the thing: I you'll had have fun. the Ubuntu Mate installed with all the tools I needed, working awesome. Good. If it wasn't for the Skylake issues, I would be totally fine. Like, yeah. There was nothing wrong, you know. Apps was fine. You'll probably uh, find uh, sooner than later they'll probably have some updates out because that's got to be affecting that, a lot. That's what Popey was saying on Twitter. Yeah, he says, yeah. "Oh, it's upstream and it'll fix itself one uh, day." Yeah, always yeah. kind of goes like that, doesn't it? Well, Mr. Dominic, yeah. where should people read more about your adventures? Just Maybe your Twitter Dom- feed. At uh, Dumanuku on Twitter or DominicM.com. Well, uh, I hope everything goes amazing Wednesday. And uh, if uh, you're not around next Monday, everybody will understand. We'll come up with something. And everybody, uh, let, give Mike your best wishes on the Twitters. You can also follow Noah on the Twitters at Colonel Linux. I'm at Chris LAS. You can check the calendar over jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to find out about live times. Anything else you want to mention, Mr. Dominic? No. Nope, I will no. try to be here Monday. It just may be a short show. <laughs> yeah, okay, that works too. All right, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in this week's episode of Coda Radio, and we'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>